how easy it is for us to, to take ownership and possession of, of things, of stuff that <coughs> hinders us from the call. So Father well, Dan is asked to help us to relinquish those things that keep us from living your will in our lives. Help us say, Lord God, not to hold on so tightly to the gifts you've given us. We miss the service that you want us to do. Father, I want to thank you for, for friends that are here today, for family, for visitors that have come to be with us. And, and Lord, you know where all of us are at. You know those that are really hurting deeply today. You know those that are struggling, Lord, with their faith today. You know those that have issues in relationships today, Lord God. And you know those that come here today because they've got lots of joy in their heart. And they're just looking forward, Lord, to, to hearing what you have to say to them. We're coming from so many different places, Jesus. And, and it is so difficult for me to be able to, to minister to everybody right where they are today. But Holy Spirit, you can do that. You know exactly what's in everybody's heart today. So I'm just asking that you will you'll move in a great way and do what I can't do. But you'll speak, Lord, into every heart today with the words that you've given me to say. May, may every person receive a little something today that will help them to, to go and do what it is that you need them to go and to do. To, to literally be Jesus. In this community. Holy Spirit, help us to do that. So today, a few words again stand between heaven and hell. And I just ask Lord to use these words the way that I never can. Jesus, amen. We're on a vacation in Doc. We must go to New York. I mean, you many of you heard that? This is this was our luggage to New York. This is what we took with us. Everybody was allowed one bag. Well, this isn't quite all of our luggage. Um, we're also allowed a carry-on bag, and so we took a carry-on bag with us, and we had pillows with us, and we had a bag of blankets that we took along with us, and we had another bag filled with food that we took along with us, and we had all this stuff that was with us on our trip. There was lots of it, and I'm just, I'm just going to be honest with you, everything there's a little bit of girl in me somewhere because I don't pack light. I, I have never figured out how to pack light. I like to pack very heavy. I take a lot of stuff with me when I'm going to go on a trip. I don't know what I'm going to wear tomorrow. I mean, how am I supposed to go next week? And so i got to pack not only for weather, not only for you know, the places we're going, but I also got to think about what, what shirt would I want to wear. Well, I might want this one, and I might want this one, and this one, yeah, I like that one. But I need these pants to go with that shirt, and those shoes don't match that shirt. I, I'm sorry, it's just the way that I am. And so I packed my suitcase and I packed a little bit of stuff in Peggy's suitcase. And a lot of stuff in Jessica's suitcase. She had the biggest suitcase. So it was, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just the way it is. It's difficult for me to, to pack light. I went to India a few years ago and um, I, I was allowed two suitcases to India. I had them really good and full uh, heading over there. Um, and, and we got to India and then we were going to. I arrived in southern India, and we're going to go to middle India. So they said I can only take one bag. Um, this, this is the bag, actually, that I took for five days. This was my five-day bag to go up to India. Now, I, I, mean, I had some books there, but I had, I had different things that were a part of, of that trip. And um, Sonny, who was the uh, guy that I was going with up to middle India, um, we went to pick him up, and he saw my bag, and he comes walking out to the car with this. <laughs> Serious, it was, it was a briefcase for five days and four nights in India. I said, Sonny, you packed light. And he says, yeah, this and Jesus, all I need. This and Jesus. Well, evidently, Sonny had uh, read the text we're going to look at this morning in Mark chapter 6. He understood what it means to uh, pack light. Get your Bibles with you this morning. I'm going to go to to Mark chapter 6. I'm going to put the scripture up on the big screen. We're going to look at a lot more today than just these few verses. But uh, let, me, let me share them with you this morning. Mark 6. When Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except the staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belt. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place. Shake the dust off your feet and testimony against them. They went out and preached. The people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. 
Look at that passage of scripture this week and have to think about luggage packing. Here's some guys that were told to pack light. They, 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 they've been disciples for quite a little while now. There, there's like three parts that they have experienced in being a disciple. They had been called. Every one of the disciples Jesus went to them, he called them out. And then Jesus connected these disciples together. Kind of a weird band of guys. You know, in mean, different places, different regions, different occupations. But he connected them together, made them, made them a group, a group of people that were following him. And while this group got together, then he started to disciple them. He just took and began to teach them and to train them up. And by the time we get to Mark chapter 6, he's going to introduce them to something that's, that's entirely different, something that's altogether new. He's going to send them out without him. I mean, to this point, every time that they did something, they did something with Jesus right there beside them. That's, that's all they knew. They had heard Jesus preach because they were there. They had seen Jesus heal. They had watched him cast out demons. They had witnessed Jesus calm the storm. They had spent time alone with Jesus and time in big crowds with Jesus. Jesus had taught them with his words. He had taught them with his actions. Now, for the first time, he was telling them to go out, and he was going to stay in this location that they had to, they had to go. And Jesus would not be physically present with them. Now, now it's time for the test. Jesus is ready to send them out. He's going to give them some, some very clear instructions. But the instructions just might not be what you expect. The instructions that he gave to them isn't exactly the kind of instructions that most of us would want Jesus to give to us. What he gave them is what not to take. These were his instructions. Listen to him. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread. No bag. No money in your belt. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place. Shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against you. Do you know what's missing from the text? Do you notice what's not there? Where to go? What to do? What to say? I mean, isn't that the kind of stuff we really want to know? I mean, if Jesus is going to send us somewhere, don't we really want to know where to go and what to do and what to say? I, I think most of us are looking for that, right? I think most of us are just waiting for Jesus to show up and say, I, I want you to do this. I, no, let's, okay, let's, just, let's play a little game here this morning. Let's just say Jesus shows up through the back doors right now, comes down the middle. He turns around and looks at you guys and says, hey, this afternoon, I want you all to go down to Emmaus, and I want you to fix a meal for all the people at Emmaus. If Jesus was standing here in this place, and he told you that, how many of you would go? <laughs> Let's just do this again. Let's just say that Jesus shows up in this place, he stands up in front, and he says to you, I need you to go down to one of the retirement homes this afternoon. I don't care which one you go to in town, but I want you to go to one of them this afternoon. And I want you to spend two hours talking to them, singing some songs, playing some games, whatever, whatever you want to do. Just go down and spend two hours at the retirement center. If Jesus stood here and told you that, how many of you would go? Uh, okay, let me give you one more. Okay, you're in your car, and Jesus is sitting in the seat next to you. And you're going through McDonald's drive through and Jesus says, I want you to buy the meal for the person behind you that's in line. Now, Jesus is sitting in the seat with you, and he tells you to do that. How many of you do that? I, I think all of us in this place, there's something inside us. Yeah, no, Jesus shows up, and Jesus tells me what to do. I'm probably going to do what Jesus tells me what to do. If he says, show up early and open door, I'm going to show up early. If he says, hand out a bulletin, I'm going to hand out a bulletin. If he says, pour a cup of coffee and give it to somebody, I'm going to pour a coffee and give it to somebody. Because I'm just waiting for Jesus to tell me what to do. But Jesus never told them what to do. Jesus wasn't concerned about what they did. He was concerned about what they took. And that seems really odd. It just doesn't quite fit because I, I'm not too worried about... Jesus is more worried about the packing instructions. He's more worried about the packing instructions. And you know, I started thinking about it. What tends to keep us from our mission is the packing instructions. It seems to be the thing that keeps so many of us from 
actually serving. I mean, I'm okay with going to the Emmaus Center if I can cook what I want to cook. I'm okay with visiting the retirement home if I can go when I want to go. I'm okay with buying food for the vehicle behind me as long as I can look at the rearview mirror and make sure it's not a bus. <laughs> But when I can, I can pack what I want to pack for the journey, I'm way better than when Jesus tells me to go without packing. Yeah, Jesus does exactly the opposite. He tells them what to pack, and he doesn't tell them what to do. Don't take any bread. Don't take a bag. Don't take any extra money. Don't take an extra set of clothes. Don't put the holiday in. Okay, maybe you didn't say it quite that way. But don't put the holiday in. If they welcome you, stay. If they don't welcome you, just go someplace else. If he doesn't tell them where to go, he doesn't tell them what to do, he doesn't tell them what to say, he just tells them what to take. And what are they supposed to take? What are they supposed to take? Nothing. That, that even makes it more difficult, doesn't it? A staff. That's, that's all that they can take is just a staff. And that's just crazy. Jesus' answer is to take nothing. Jesus tells them to take nothing because stuff often keeps people from doing ministry. Stuff tends to be a problem. Jesus tells these guys to take nothing because nothing it's easier to work with sometimes than something. My, my, my dad, he, he gave me a great example of this uh, before I got work with my father. My father was a constructor, was a contractor, and um, in, in the construction trade, a lot, a lot of contractors smoke. And my dad didn't like the idea of a guy having a cigarette in one hand and trying to work with another hand, so he made a rule very quickly in, in the construction industry. You can smoke at break, and you can smoke at lunch, and you can smoke at break. You can smoke before work, and you can smoke after work. But during the work hours, there's no smoking because he said a contractor has to have two hands. That thing in their hand will keep them from doing what they need to be doing. And so he would never let them smoke while they were um, working. And I got thinking about what kind of things do we hold on to that keep us from the work that Jesus wants us to do? What do we hold on to that keeps us from serving? See, there's often something in our hand that keeps us from doing what Jesus wants us to do. Are we holding so tightly to our money that we can't do what Jesus wants us to do? Are we holding so tightly to our time that we can't do what Jesus wants us to do? Are we holding so tightly to our houses that we can't do what Jesus wants us to do? Are we holding so tightly to our children that we can't do what Jesus wants us to do? Are we holding so tightly to something that we can't hug someone? Are we holding so tightly to something that we can't feed someone? Are we holding so tightly to something that we can't invite somebody to come to our house? Are our hands too full to love somebody in the kingdom of God? The disciples were to take nothing because something seems to always get in the way of serving Jesus. The early church really understood this concept well for pastors. Pastors weren't allowed to own a home. Churches owned houses for pastors to stay in. You know why? Because if Jesus calls them to go somewhere, the house tends to be the thing that keeps them from being able to go. And so the church solves the problem. We will not, we'll provide a house for you. You won't buy one yourself. That way if God calls you to go somewhere, you don't have anything tying you down. And I think we've all got things that are tying us, holding us, things that we're holding on to. So Jesus tells them something amazing. Instead of telling them what to do, he tells them what not to take so they can really serve. Jesus removes the things that hinder them and he replaces it with just, just one thing. What he replaced it with? Faith. Yeah. It takes a lot of faith to go on a mission like this, right? 
takes a lot of faith to leave with nothing and totally trust that God's going to take care of you, that God's going to provide for you. The disciples go on a mission, and they have to trust Jesus for everything. They will have to trust Jesus that they won't get spaghetti sauce on their shirt. They will have to trust Jesus that somebody's going to give them spaghetti to eat. They will have to trust Jesus that they have a place that they can eat their spaghetti. You can tell I'm not eating carbs. <laughs> You've got to trust Jesus for it all. Because they can't trust themselves. And so often the things that we trust in ourselves is the things that keeps us. Trust yourself. Do what Jesus calls us to. Now I'm not telling you today that you can't have stuff. But I'm asking you this. Is any of your stuff keeping you from serving? Is any of the stuff that God has put into your life keeping you from serving the way he's called you to serve? Is any of the stuff keeping you from going out and being who it is that Jesus wants you to be? You see, here's what I see this text saying. Jesus doesn't care where you go. He just wants you to go somewhere. Jesus doesn't care what you do. He just wants you to do something for him. He doesn't care who you go to. He just wants you to go to somebody. He doesn't care what side of the street you minister on. Just minister on one side of the street or the other. He doesn't care when you leave. He just wants you to leave and do something. He doesn't care who you love. He just wants you to love someone. And so often, stop. It's in the way of us doing those very Stuff that holds us back. I was halfway through my trip to New York, and I wish I wouldn't have had so much stuff. <laughs> we sort of packed a little lighter for the journey. Right, Allie? Yeah, <laughs> yeah she was on the trip with us. The only thing is, is Jesus goes on. There's, there's another story. There's this really weird story that's next. And, and, and Mark um, 6, 7 starts with this story about Jesus sending the disciples. And then there's another story in the middle. And there's the story in verse 30 that tells them that the disciples came back. And there's this section. And Mark's been doing this. If you've been following me in this series, it seems like Mark sticks things in here to try to teach us something. And you're kind of going, what the heck, Mark? That doesn't make any sense. And the story that's in the middle right now that we have to deal with for just a minute is, is this guy by the name of John the Baptist. Remember John? We talked about him clear back a month ago. He was in Mark 1 and Mark 2. This is the story of a guy wearing camel's hair. He was baptizing people, telling people to repent. Now we find him in Mark chapter 6, um, verse 14 through 29. He's, he's in prison. And Herod has put him in prison. And Herod likes to listen to him. Herod likes to talk to him. And so every once in a while, he brings him out of prison. He lets um, John the Baptist talk a little bit. And then he sends John the Baptist back to prison. Because he doesn't want to do what he says. He just wants to hear. He doesn't want to do anything with it. That's the problem sometimes, isn't it? Just want to hear what they want to do. That, that was the problem with Herod. Now, Herod had married Herodias. Herodias was Herod's brother Philip's wife. This is kind of weird. Herod's got a brother named Philip. Philip had married Herodias. And now somehow or other, Herod is married to Herodias. So this is Herod's brother's wife. Now, Herod's brother's wife, who is now Herod's wife, doesn't like John the Baptist because John the Baptist is complaining about this weird marriage. It's kind of weird, right? Just a minute, it's a little weird. Now, one day, they have this big party, and, and Herod's brother's wife has a daughter with Philip. Okay, so it would be a uh, stepson slash niece. <laughs> and she's dancing in front of Herod provocatively, and he likes it weird. And, and Herod likes it so much, he says this, I'll give you anything up to half the kingdom. Half the kingdom. This must have been a heck of a dance. <laughs> Now, that wasn't supposed to be accepted, but she didn't know any better, so she did. So she went to her mom, who is Herodias, the wife of Philip, that's now the wife of Herod, who doesn't like John the Baptist and has a daughter that's dancing in front of her husband. What is it that you want me to ask for, Mom? She says, John the Baptist's head on a platter. Oh, uh, we've been talking about anger for a long time on that, right? Because you can get half the king and mind what's ahead. She hated him so much. 
compared to the man that's working than we didn't want to be. Cut off John the Baptist's head, put it on a platter, gave it to the daughter, and took it to her mother. And then the disciples come back from their mission. It's that story. But why do we start hearing about these guys that aren't allowed to take any baggage? And then there's the story of John the Baptist being beheaded, and then we come back and the guys show up. And... I think Mark's trying to tell us something. For you to be a follower of Jesus, what cost you everything? What cost you everything? Oh, to really follow him, it's costly. Think about it. John the Baptist loses his head because he loves God the Father. And Jesus hangs on a cross because he loves God the Father. Twelve disciples, Judas hangs himself, and ten more are all killed because of their faith. They need everything because they love the Father. And I'm not saying today in this church that you're going to lose your life following Jesus. Not going to, maybe you're not going to be beheaded because you're a Christ follower. If you're a Christ follower. What's the price of following Jesus? Everything. It costs you your life. So what are you holding on to today that you're not willing to give to Jesus? What, what, what do you have to pack in your bag if you're going to be a Christ follower? What, what is it that you said, okay, Jesus, I'm willing to be a Christ follower as long as I can take my makeup case with me. And as long as I've got six extra shirts along for this journey, and as long as my curling iron is here, and I need a whole place for all of my shoes, then, 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 then I'll talk. <clears throat> like I was talking this week, this isn't a very popular message. Because so often in Christianity today, we want to give Jesus a little bit and feel really good about it. But Jesus wants, wants all. All. Because he gave all of himself. Father, I just pray we have you. We understand you gave up everything for us, and now you're calling us to, to pack lightly for this journey with you. God, it's so easy to, to get hung up on all the things that we have to have our wants, our desires, our needs. God, we just have to trust you in this journey. We just have to trust you. We just have to, to give up these things that are so, so important to us. That in the end, really don't bring us a lot of happiness. The things that we have to have, God, that end up in a closet somewhere, never be worn again. God, help us to hold on to this life loosely. Help us to hold on to you tight. Lord, I just pray today that, that you, Holy Spirit, will move in our minds right now and, and just help us to see what we're holding on to too tightly this morning. Holy Spirit, help each of us to understand today what it is that keeps us from really serving, from really going out and being your servant. God, if it's, if it's our children, help us to give our children to you and trust that you're a God who will care for our children. If it's our job, help us to just trust, Lord God, that you're a God who will use our job and not um, something we have to possess. If it's a car or a house, if it's a 401k, whatever it is, Lord God, help us just to trust that you're big enough to handle that and I can give it to you. That you'll hold on to that for me. Can trust that you have my best always in heart. God, as we leave this place today, you've got a call on all of our lives to go and to serve. This week, show us, Lord. If there's a moment that we're not willing to go and serve because of something else, show us what it is. Bring this message to mind, Holy Spirit. Bring it back to us so we'll know that there's something that we're holding on to. 
That if there's a moment that you call us to go and we're not willing to go, show us why we weren't willing to go in that moment so we can truly be the servant that you call us to be. You've got to call on all of our lives. Help us, Father, to go, trusting you that you will do the work through us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As you go, hold on to this world light and hold on to Jesus like he's all you've got. Because Jesus is all you have. Amen? Amen. Go in peace.